Um, so can everyone see my screen okay? Yeah. Excellent. Um, so the, the, the outline of this seminar is going to be, James is the working group lead, and so he's gonna give them a couple of minutes introduction to the working group for those of you who haven't been to the, well, we only did one session on this kind of bioinformatics working group before, but why we're doing a seminar on training. Um, and then we've got seven people that are gonna give like five minute presentations, introducing their training and what kind of schemes they're promoting um, and giving us a bit more information about the different things that um, they're representing. Um, so these are what you will have seen on the, um, the Eventbrite invitation, and these are also what were up on the website. Um, so we can kind of go into these in more detail. And then at the end, we're going to have a panel where we're going to have everybody together, and we're hopefully going to have people asking us questions about kind of more general training questions, or if there's uh, a particular thing you're interested in that somebody's brought up, that's the time when we're going to really encourage you to ask questions. Um, and if you could drop those in the chat, you can also, we can kind of pick them up at the end. Um, so I think I will just let James start. Brilliant. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, and thanks again to Sarah and Angie and Louise for arranging all of this. So I've been given five minutes to introduce things. And I thought the best thing to do was really sort of set the scene in terms of why I think this is important, which is quite a personal journey. So, yeah, if we can go on to the next slide, please, Sarah. So this all started for me about nine years ago when uh, we got some pump priming money to collect some omics data and then I realised I didn't know what to do with it once we'd actually collected it. Um, and so we started in Excel, which is somewhat limiting. Um, I managed to work out that I could do visualisations in Excel, but also that I was limited to 250 lines per graph which had never previously been a problem for me, uh, but very quickly became a problem when you're, start, when you're dealing with really big data. So we've gone from the panels on the left to the panels on the right. And if you press down once more, that's due in large fact to having people that do bioinformatics in my group. Although I have also been learning how to code over the last few years. And, and it was my personal experience of learning to code and wrangling data that has sort of caused me to push some slides together and to really sort of push the idea that people need training because as those of you that are starting out are probably realizing there's loads of information out there but even knowing what the right question is to ask at the beginning is quite difficult and there's lots of parts to bioinformatics most of the time you can't just fire up an app and get the answer you want even if it shows you something useful normally you need to intervene in it in some way so that it actually tells you something specific about your data okay if we go on to the next slide please so i think you can break this down into a, a number of challenges one's around software another one's around hardware um, there are obviously skills uh, and then it's about time. And I've got one slide on each of these just to give you a flavor of the kinds of things that I encountered that I think you need to think about. Okay, so software. Next slide, please. Okay, so this, this was, I guess people will realize as they start doing this that, uh, you know, when you're learning from scratch, bioinformatics has got really quite a steep learning curve. And that was really illustrated for me by this. So I searched online, found this Kalamazoo metagenome assembly tutorial, which I thought was gonna answer all my problems and then hit loads and loads of issues, which I have to say, I'm quite proud of the fact that I, I persisted with it, although there was quite a lot of swearing along the way. And then it didn't tell me the answer that I wanted at the end. However, you know, no learning is bad learning. So it was a useful experience and it alerted me to uh, lots of different things. Uh, one of which is that, you know, you might find a piece of software that you think is right for you and it might not work on the HPC facilities that you have available to you. And that's something that um, part of my group and other colleagues at the University of York are starting to look at in terms of pushing things onto the cloud where you can fix your computer so that it will always work with the piece of software that you care about which um, is increasingly a problem as things change so quickly. Okay, if we can go on to the next slide. 
Um, that is illustrated here. So at York in the last nine years in the biology department, we've had at least three different uh, high performance computer setups that we've had access to. They've all worked in slightly different ways. So we've had to adjust and adapt how we run jobs on those kinds of things. Obviously, if you then don't have enough local compute, you can go up to something bigger. So we have two facilities that are open to the northern eight universities called Archer and Bede. Bede is completely different to Archer because it's uh, all GPU based. So again, a very different sort of compute. Then there are some national facilities. So CLIMB, which has morphed into CLIMB Big Data, which is cloud bioinformatics for uh, microbial work. And that's really nice because it, it kind of I guess is a precursor to this idea that you can have a fixed image that you can access that isn't going to change. So you can just hopefully fire up a program without having to go through the pain of reinstall it. Um, and most recently, uh, we're starting to look at cloud computers, I mentioned. So, and again, there are lots of different providers for this. Uh, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft, which offers Azure, uh, uh, I guess, three of the big ones, but there are other things out there as well. Okay, if we can move on again. Okay, so then the big challenge, of course, when you start, once you've worked out whether there's a piece of software that you want to use and uh, you've got the hardware to run it, is again, this is most of this stuff is not app based, it's not point and click. You need to be able to do stuff in a window with words. Um, so there are lots of things to learn about, like Unix command line, writing shell scripts, how you get things onto queues, how you specify resources when you're using an HPC computer. You may or may not be allowed to install uh, software on your local HPC, and if you do, that can offer challenges of its own. Um, and then there's the frustration that even though you've found the piece of software that you think does what you want, you still have to somehow wrangle your data either in or out so it's in the right format for that computer or visualize it afterwards and so learning some sort of coding can be really useful and particularly my group is now at the point where we are putting together pipelines so we want to use four or five or six or seven different programs one after another and even that gets boring when you've got you know several hundred files that you want to run through something so stringing them together with uh software like Snakemake has become really interesting and a useful skill for us to employ. And this whole thing is an even bigger problem if you're not really working in the biomedical arena, which is why EBNet in particular, having um, a bioinformatics working group, I think is important because the reality is everyone does a slightly different experiment and everyone wants a bespoke analysis. And that takes time. And really, the people collecting the data often are the ones best placed to work out exactly how they want to interrogate their data. And then, of course, that means a whole different set of skills from using pipettes or digging holes in the ground or whatever it is that you, you do in your day job that's giving you the data that you want to analyze. Right. I think I might have one more slide. OK, yeah. So this is the last point to make to you. All of this takes time. Uh, and you have to invest a bit of time in this. And it is particularly frustrating at the beginning because of this steep learning curve. So first of all, you need to think about your data. If you're writing code, think about how you do that. Is, uh, you know, it's like doing crossword puzzles, but once you get there, it's great. Um, then there's queue time. That, that sort of runs into this HPC resource. Uh, you know, most of the time, if you're using HPC, you're sharing it with other people. And that means that sometimes, depending on the resources you require, you can be waiting for quite a long time. There's the actual time it takes things to run. We have an experience with Google where they very kindly set up a bespoke instance for us. Uh, it still took two weeks of compute time for it to be able to crunch through the data that we were looking at. And in hindsight, that was quite a small data set compared to the, the eight terabyte data set that Annie is going to talk to you about uh, a bit later today. And then there's 
what you do once you've done your analysis. You know, normally it doesn't stop there. You want to be able to visualize it. You want to interpret it. And then once you've seen the results you've got, of course, that gives you more questions that you want to answer. So you may well want to go back and reanalyze your data in a slightly different way. We have not yet hit the point where we have enough resources that we can really optimize some of our analyses. We're normally just pleased that we've got to the end. Um, and the thought of doing it again is, is quite daunting. But obviously the time will come where we are going to be able to access enough compute where we can really optimize some of the steps that we're doing um, and and that obviously depending on exactly what you're looking at may become important for you very very quickly so for all those reasons i think that bioinformatics training is important and hopefully the rest of the session people will talk about what's available to you now and also hopefully we'll be able to gather some information on what you would like that you can't find out there at the moment okay Hopefully that wasn't more than five minutes, but I suspect it was. Uh, for the next talk, would you like to share your slides or would you be quite happy for me to click through them for you? Thanks. Can I just confirm, uh, do I have five minutes or less? No, you, you have five minutes. If it goes over slightly, that's also fine. OK, so because, you know, things can... Uh, Okay, so my name, uh, hi, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks uh, to Sarah, Emma, and uh, for everybody who has organized this uh, seminar. Uh, so my name is Giacomo Peru. I work, I'm based at Edinburgh, University of, Ed of Edinburgh, EPCC, Edinburgh Parallel Computing Center, which manages um, supercomputers, you know, as a long history in managing and providing support to uh, researchers who use supercomputers. For example, we do at Edinburgh uh, manage Archer, who has been mentioned earlier. Um, Software Sustainability Institute, uh, of which I'm project coordinator, is a, a collaborat collaborative project um, funded about 10 years ago by UKRI, EPSRC and other councils um, with a mission to support researchers who make use of uh, software and computing, uh, support them by providing um, training, uh, access, facilitate them in this uh, in, in this uh, in this use, uh, very much tr uh, trying to build a bridge between specific domain uh, domain research and skills and uh, computing and software, which is very much what uh, I'm understanding this uh, this network as a mission to do. Uh, so this is myself. I'm here. Um, my intention in this couple of minutes and in this seminar is to give you an outline of a set of training resources specifically for bioinformatics people that we've developed uh, within a dash one of the several dash pro uh, projects uh, funded by mrc about a year ago um, so uh, give you um, some information of how to access the courses as learners, but also, if you are interested, invite you to take part in the helping and teaching these, uh, these courses, which is also very much um, a purpose of this, uh, of this project. So, a DASH training program, uh, the objective is to develop and deliver data science Oh, data science training. Um, sorry, I forgot to time myself, so I'm starting just now. Um, and deliver data science training uh, using the Carpentries methodology. I'm not going to, to speak about the Carpentries here. Ask me question uh, if you have about that. But in very briefly, it's, a, it's an open source organization, uh, collaborative international organization, which develops and deliver uh, data science and software development training to researchers mainly. And, you know, uh, using this format, we've put together this project and we've developed a set of courses 
um, in three main groups, thematic groups, which are computational workflows, Conda, Nextflow, Snake Make, Open Science Fair Principle, and Statistics. A little note is that not all the courses that I'm going to uh, offer to you now uh, are, have been developed within a dash, but in fact, in, um, in introduction to statistics and machine learning within another funding um, and, you know, MRN, uh, one of uh, these courses were led by uh, MRN present here. Uh, next slide, please. So let's come to computational workflows. Okay, so we've got three, um, three, uh, three workshops in this group. One is, sorry, one is Conda, uh, which is a package manager. Um, it's an introduction to Conda with an emphasis on bioinformatics. Conda is an open source package and environment manage management system that runs on Windows, Mac, and Linux. It installs, runs, and updates packages and their dependencies. Uh, it creates easily, uh, saves, loads, and switches between environments uh, on local computers. Next one will be um, Nextflow. Nextflow, uh, this workshop made of four half days is a, uh, an introduction to the workflow manager Nextflow and NF Core. Um, Nextflow enables a scalable and reproducible scientific workflows using software environments like Conda. It allows the adaptation of pipelines written in the most common scripting languages such as Bash, R, and Python. Then we've got SnakeMake, uh, which is, it's, it's a, um, the SnakeMake workflow system provides effective solution to um, workflow pro, uh, problems in bioinformatics. And I'm just going very quickly uh, over this because I will give you, you can, uh, you know these tools and you can read more information on the workshop web pages, which I can provide you later. Um, I don't want to overrun too much. Then we've, got, we've developed uh, three statistics and uh, machine learning work, um, workshops. With, uh, one is an introductory statistics developed by a team uh, led by Emma Rand in York. A high dimensional statistics with R. Introduction to statistics also uses R. High dimensional statistics uh, also uses R. They are both four half days. Uh, high dimensional statistics has been developed um, by a team uh, and a Dash team in Edinburgh. And finally, we've just finished. This took a little bit more time to develop a uh, uh, potentially very popular um, machine learning workshop, um, which I would like to, uh, using Python, um, which is a another four half days. It will start with an introduction to machine learning, uh, a lesson on uh, trees, and a lesson on neural networks, and finally, a very interesting uh, lesson on responsible machine learning. Finally, we have a workshop on fair data management uh, with a specific focus on bi biology and bioinformatics. Now, all these workshops, uh, there will be several instances of this workshop between now and February 2023. I will uh, get the, the mailing list of this group and circulate uh, the announcements. We announced, the, we open the registrations month by month and uh, we circulate them uh, across the UK and also uh, abroad, also because they are remote. Um, 
they are free. There is a 50 pounds de refundable deposit once uh, just, you know, to keep the no-shows uh, at, bay, at bay. And um, we would be also very interested in um, getting interest from you if any of you is interested in helping and teaching. Um, we pay uh, the hours of, you know, we pay this work. We have a budget for paying this work. Uh, just get in touch with me if you are interested. Uh, all workshops have, are already staffed until uh, November, but we've got a lot of uh, places for, uh, from November onward. So I'll stop here because I think I've already uh, spoken for a little bit once. Thank you. Um, sorry, if, if you don't mind, I think I'm going to share my, my screen myself. Um, I think Google has messed up a little bit with my PowerPoint. <laughs> That's okay. I think you have quite a few slides to click through as well. Yeah, yeah, that as well. Give me one second, I'll start sharing. If anyone would like to hear more about um, the courses that Guacamo has just mentioned, we can also talk about those at the end of the panel as well. Okay, so I think it should be working now. Can you all see my screen? Yeah, brilliant. Okay, so um, I'm also going to talk about a Dash project, so a little bit like a Commons project, but um, ours is a little bit different in the sense that we are looking into delivering training and training data steward ambassadors as well. And in this project, I'm the community manager. So probably I'm not going to be able to explain you the nitty gritty details of the technical part of our project, but um, the solutions and the training part that we can deliver, which I think is, is what you're looking for. So hopefully you find this interesting. But before we go into the actual details of the project, I'd actually like to set the biggest, the bigger picture, the scene. And I think this will be something you can all relate to. So um, some of you may know that a couple of weeks ago, it was St. George, actually, um, the patron of England. And this inspired me to talk to you today about our project as the story of St. George and the dragon. So for those of you who don't know the tale, legend has it that the dragon was terrorizing the local people of the village. And so to appease the creature, they began to give tributes and sacrifice animals to feed its hunger until they no longer had any. So the king then decreed that they must offer the local children to keep the dragon at bay. And so each day the lottery chose a sacrifice until the king's daughter, the princess, was selected. And as she was being led to the dragon, then George happened by and so horrified by what was discovered, then he offered to slay the dragon and rescue the village from its claws and fire. And so what does this all have to do with data stewardship and the Dash project? Well, if you think about it, each public institution in the UK, be it a university, a research institute, ministries, hospitals, they are all castles in the story and they are seized by a dragon that feeds on data. And so each day we keep it at bay by giving away our tributes, our data from projects from research or this um, data. We, it might be that we don't give it away, but it's locked away from being used in other projects. And so we, it, we reach to a point where we realize we're losing too much our princess, the too valuable tribute that we can't afford to lose. And this is when our, our knights, our St. George's, our data stewards, 
they can come into rescue and get back all the tributes on our princess and make use of this data. But going back to the actual important point, we, we unfortunately have hurdles, we unfortunately have dragons at each and every castle, each and every organization. And so in our project, we realized that there are at least three common dragons and hurdles. And the first one is time and funding. I think we've already said this with, with the two previous presentations, actually. There's also limited resources and staff funding that goes away with each political change, just the distribution of wealth, all these problems that we all know about. I'm sure everyone knows the struggle. But we also have the number two, which is the problem with buy-in. <clears throat> so if our kings, <clears throat> sorry, I'm losing my voice today. <laughs> So if our kings and, and the queens and the senior leadership, basically, they do not realize that we are losing our princess, then we lose her because no one will ever look for a St. George to come rescue her. So basically, we, we do realize we need to make them aware and angry because we're losing so much. And then finally, and I think this is the most important thing here, is actually this skill bid. So the capacity building is vital. And I think it is very clear that we can't afford to keep hiring staff, but we need to train the existing workforce and a highly qualified workforce in their fields, but mostly unaware of, of data and how to manage it and make it reusable. And so that again takes time and funding. So you'll be thinking, well, you just come in here and tell us that you are our St. George's that will happen to pass by and rescue you. Well, this is where the story differs from our proposition. And this is because we believe that there are St. George's in each and every castle. Those data stewards already exist in each and every institution. The problem is they have no weapons. And what is an eye to do against the dragon without a sword? So what we are proposing is actually a fellowship of ambassadors that can make a call to change within every organization. And so we'll be tackle, tackling all these three hurdles that we talked about, the skills, the buy-in and the time and funding. The skills in the sense that we are going to equip these fellows, they are going to be creating videos of about five minutes that anyone can understand and that anyone can watch. This is all going to be open. And also we're going to provide training at each organization. So if there's a fellow at your organization, actually um, one at York, Annabella's is talking afterwards. So. So um, there's going to be training being delivered there. And also Annabella is, is one of the people that are going to be creating these videos. So you're gonna benefit from it if you have one there. We're also tackling the buy-in because we target senior leadership as well. We're looking for fellows that can be ambassadors at all levels. So from PhDs to senior professors, because we understand that that change needs to happen bottom up obviously, but also from the top down. And so we already have the first cohort of fellows that we can already see quite a lot of variety of fields and people at different stages of their careers. And like I said, from associate professors to early career research fellows. We also have fellows who are data experts themselves at different stages of their careers. Like I said, Annabelle here is, is one of them. Um, and finally, even PhD students. So really at, at all the stages that you can imagine. And then finally, we also offer funding. I think this is a very important bit because like I said before, there's a problem with time and funding, there's that risk. And so we provide an honorary payment and recognition for this work that the fellows are giving. But um, all this sounds very nice and obviously there's, there's no always an easy way. So what is realistic of what we're doing? So right now we've identified the problems. We are targeting them with these fellows that, that are going to be part of the project. And there's going to be probably an early success. Training is going to be delivered. Everyone can get this benefit at every single organization. But obviously the project might end, it might be a setback, and the fellows that have completed the task, they stop having anything else to do. But um, we have partnered with a larger network of successful communities of practice. We've actually partnered with the Sustain Software Sustainability Institute that is going to talk afterwards. And obviously they have a community of practice with more than 10 years of expertise, and we're glad to have their experience on board to make our fellowship sustainable as well, and so that you can benefit from that training in the long term as well, not just throughout the project. And on top of that, we're also part of a wider community. This is the Legacy UK, and currently it's already 21 UK universities and research institutes. So really it is, is, is a bigger effort. It's not just one project, and it's part of, of a larger community. 
And if we expand this even larger way, because if you think about Elixir, Elixir is an even broader community that expands across Europe. Elixir UK is only one country within a, commun a community of 200 institutions. And I'm saying this because we have a larger expert community that is reviewing and improving the content we produce so that you can be sure that our training materials are accurate, they are up to date and they're delivered in a way that you can understand it. So basically the question that I think we all here agree is that data management is not if you get on board, but how and when you get on board. And so I think it is a quite enticing proposition what we're saying here, because really if you start creating these materials as a fellow, or if you start using these materials as a fellow, you can be a pioneer with us. I think probably data management is going to be everywhere in every organization, but we are at a stage where we can be the pioneers. So this is this is a proposition I'm bringing to you today. So um, please, if you if you want to become part of the fellowship, there's actually a second cohort opening in two days. So I'll, I'll leave my, my email on the chat if you're more interested about this. And also, if you're interested in having any updates about the videos that we are developing, the courses, and whether there's a course being delivered at your organization, you can email me as well. And thank you very much to everyone, also Sarah, for um, being so timely with everything, with the presentations and everything. That's great. Thanks. Uh, Emma, you're up next. Do you want me to share the slides or are you quite happy to share yours? I can share mine. Excellent. Oh, gosh, I must change my Zoom setting. That means the windows shoot all over the place when you go full screen. You can see my slides now. That's great. Lovely. Hi, welcome everybody. Um, so uh, I'm going to tell you about a project called CloudSpan, which is led by James Chong and myself at the University of York. It's actually a collaboration with the Software Sustainability Institute. And the goal of this project is to train researchers in cloud-based high-performance computing um, for specialised analyses in genomics. Ooh, let me just move a window here. Okay, so CloudSpain came out of our desire to address some of the issues that James was discussing at the beginning, particularly with regards to the difficulties in uh, installing software and getting all the software um, to talk to each other properly. Uh, so it's an omics training program designed for both researchers and for research computing support teams. And our course materials are entirely deployed in containers on cloud-based HPC and we're using Amazon Web Services. And the key thing is that our users only need to install a Bash shell so they can access the cloud instance, and then they should be able to use all the software without having to install it themselves. So our goal is to make the teaching materials fair, which is uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, uh, which I think Evelyn's going to talk about more at the end. Um, and the reason for that is we want people to be able to reuse our teaching materials, um, both by self-study, but also hopefully they will also be able to deliver the workshop and spin up our instances on their own, in their own institutions. So our teaching has three strands. And I think I spotted a few people in the call today who might have been at some of those courses. Uh, we have a foundational strand, which uh, teaches data management analysis for genomics. Uh, we have an advanced strand and we have a train the trainer strand. So in the foundational strand, uh, in the genomics teaching, we've been teaching command line tools for tasks like uh, read quality, trimming, filtering reads, aligning reads and variant calling. And in doing that, we realized that people are coming into the, the course with very different backgrounds. So we've developed a course called Prenomics which gives people more time to pick up some of those fundamental computing ideas like understanding your file system, what a working directory is, getting a bash shell running, a little bit of moving around in the bash shell and uh, navigating your file system. Uh, so we run that course now uh, before genomics to give people a bit more time with those foundational ideas. And we've also developed a self-assessment tool to help people work out whether they would benefit from doing the prenomics course before the genomics course. So in the advanced courses, uh, one of them is going to be, oh, it's almost finished now, uh, how to launch your own Amazon instance. 
using ours as a template. Um, so that means you'll be able to uh, do the training materials by self-study. You don't have to fall in with our schedule. And we've designed these so that you can run them under the free tier of Amazon Web Services. And the course explains how to get an account and use that account. Uh, we're also working on a metagenomics course, uh, which Sarah, I think, will be talking about after me. And we'll be planning other courses on experimental design and um, scheduling and automation on cloud-based systems. So the train the trainer part is the bit that's really aimed at research computing support teams or HPC teams that might want to deliver our course in their own institution or spin up the instances for people to self-study in their own institution. So we're planning to produce uh, cloud administration guides and workflows for teams to be able to do that more easily without having to work it all out from scratch. Uh, so how do we plan to teach? Um, our teaching is mainly small groups, so less than 30 people. We've got both online and in-person options to try and make them accessible as possible. Um, we have diversity scholarships, which means you can apply for money uh, to get to an in-person workshop, but also to cover costs like childcare or any accessibility needs or support needs that you might have to allow you to actually participate in the training from home. And we're supported by a series of code retreats. So these are one day events in which people that have done our courses can come to York and spend a concentrated period of time practicing with the resources, trying to apply the methods to their own data and uh, away from their office and the stresses of normal life, along with a bit of support. So it's that kind of follow up contact. So it gives you a chance to actually practice stuff from the courses. And we're also in the process of setting up our community of practice, which is for um, supporting uh, users and helping us interact with users and users to interact with each other and develop a sort of ongoing community of practice around our materials. So I have run over slightly, I'm afraid, but I just want to introduce you to our excellent team here, Sarah and Annabelle, who are both bioinformaticians. I've got uh, Jorge Bruno Chavez and Emma Barnes, who are both um, high performance computing specialists. Uh, Emma leads the research computing team here at York. And Evelyn is our community manager and also responsible for the fairing of the project. And Sarah Dowsland, who keeps us all on track, is our project administrator. So I'll just finish up there with leaving you that slide of telling you when we'll be uh, delivering things next. So we have a prenomics course online in November, uh, genomics in person in York in December. A self study will appear very soon. The Create Your Own Instance will appear very soon. Code retreats will be scheduled over the next uh, year. And uh, we're planning the metagenomics to be online sort of uh, autumn, spring. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for overrunning there, Sarah. I've run by over a minute. That's OK. I will stop sharing. OK, so. Um, sorry, I've closed the, <laughs> okay. Ooh, let me turn it. Right. Can everyone see my screen okay? Okay. Um, so I think you probably know my name because I might have said it at the top of this session, but um, I'm Sarah Forrester. I'm a member of James Chong's lab and I'm a bioinformatician slash postdoc at the University of York. And I'm gonna be talking about um, how I'm using my Software Sustainability Institute Fellowship 
um, to develop the metagenomic bioinformatics training materials that Emma has already mentioned. So um, you'll have heard a bit of this already uh, from Guacamo at the beginning of the session, but the Software Sustainability Institute has been around since 2010. And it's basically an institute that aims to facilitate the advancement of software and research, and it's trying to cultivate a better, more sustainable environment for research software and for researchers that use software. So the mantra is better software, better research. And one of the ways in which this is facilitated is through their fellowship program. So you heard about the Elixir fellowship uh, program. So this is a kind of slightly different, but kind of similar fellowship program. Um, and all of the fellows, and um, when they have an application, they are often saying that they're gonna, you know, develop some training materials or they're gonna use a practice that will help them uh, develop some kind of sustainable research software or maybe teach about these practices. Um, so as has already met, been mentioned, the SSI also has a partnership with the Carpentries. So this is a suite of different programs and that give you uh, course information on things such as data management, but also analysis skills such as introduction to R and command line, um, or there's also some introduction to Python courses as well. Um, and I'm just going to put this caveat here that um, I only became an SSI fellow in 2022. So Emma is a previous, uh, well, is still a SSI fellow, but she's from a previous year. And Guacamo is also an SSI fellow. So they have a lot more know-how about the SSI generally than I do. Um, so I wouldn't consider myself, you know, like the great representative for the SSI, but this is just to show you how the SSI fellowship is enabling me to apply my metagenomic knowledge from my research to develop training material. Um, so what bioinformatics training will my fellowship involve? So um, both me and Annabelle Kansdell, who's going to talk after this, are going to be developing a metagenomics course. So this is going to be adapted from carpentry lessons that are currently in the carpentry's incubator. So the incubator is a place for carpentry lessons that are actively being developed and they aren't like in a stable state. So if you had a look on the incubator, so anyone can go and have a look at the incubator if they want, it's open source. Um, you'll see that if you type in metagenomics, you get a list of five courses available. But actually only one of these is an actual metagenomics course. The others are actually courses that enable you to have the skills in, able, in order to do the metagenomics course. So four of these actually cover things such as the introduction to command line, introduction to R, how to organize your data, et cetera. Um, so we're basically gonna be building on this metagenomics um, course that's already available. Um, and as I'm, both me and Annabelle are part of CloudSpan, which uh, Emma has mentioned already, um, we will be delivering these courses as an advanced course alongside um, the kind of cloud span courses that are available. So what kind of things are we going to cover in the course? So we're going to cover QCing your data. Um, so how to see whether your data is OK and what data you should filter out and to move on to the next steps. We're also going to cover things such as generating an assembly from your reads, uh, QCing to see how good this assembly is putting this assembly into bins so that you can generate what we call a mag, which is a metagenome assembled uh, genome. So these are kind of putative genomes that we have isolated in one bin. And then identify what the taxonomy of these mags that we've binned are. And um, we're also gonna cover things such as uh, annotating functional information. So you could figure out what the genomes that you've assembled, what kind of metabolisms they might have present. And um, so I've just put some images here. So this is a fast QC plot. So this is a QC piece of software. This is a bandage plot, which is a way of visualizing um, genome assemblies. And this is just to show you KEG, because KEG is one of the main databases that we use for the functional annotation. So we're also going to be adding some additional content to kind of add on to the metagenomics course as it stands. Um, and one of the things that we're really focused on is adding in uh, information about long read sequencing methods um, at both the assembly and the QC step. So for metagenomics, long read sequencing has really transfor transformed how good our assemblies can be. Um, and this really has an impact on our tax taxonomy uh, downstream as well. 
So we'll also be reducing the non-metagenome specific content from the course so that you could focus on that metagenome uh, specific content um, and not be kind of bogged down by the other things. But because this is under the umbrella of the CloudSpan course, then obviously you could go on the other courses alongside it. Um, we'll also cover things such as um, how to kind of pick the appropriate database for your kind of analysis. So I work on, our di and on anaerobic digestion. And so there are specific databases that are more suitable for the kind of analysis that I want to look at. Um, and this can have a real effect on your taxonomic annotations downstream. Um, and we're also going to look at how to perform these stages using AWS. And we're going to reiterate the importance of making data sets publicly available. Um, so as Emma mentioned before, this course is due to be delivered um, by me and Annabelle. We, we, haven't, we haven't developed it yet, but uh, we're thinking that it's going to be in autumn to springtime 2023. Um, and that's me for now. So Annie is the next person up. So do you want me to go through your slides? Yeah, or yeah you that's share? fine. Okay. No, you, you can carry on. Um, hi, so I'm Annabelle. Um, a lot of other people have covered sort of what I do today. So I thought I'd take a different angle and just, show, just answer sort of the question, why bioinformatics is important um, from sort of a case study standpoint. So you heard James earlier say, uh, we had this eight terabyte data set um, so if you could go to the next slide, please. So with DNA sequencing, um, some of you might be aware, so that's a little min eye in there, as we've already mentioned long reads. Um, it is getting a lot faster and a lot cheaper to generate large amounts of data, both through long reads and also uh, through Illumina sequencing, et cetera. Prices have come down quite a lot, even since I started. Um, so it's getting really easy to generate a lot of large amounts of sequencing, especially with metagenomics. You can just sort of throw in as much, well, not as much as you want, but you can throw a lot in. Um, and it's how you then get something out that's important. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, please. So just as a quick case study, Sarah already mentioned, uh, we work with anaerobic digestion. This particular eight terabyte uh, thing was a metagenomic time series data set. So we had both a combination of nanopore and Illumina sequencing. Um, in total, this, this came to about eight terabytes of raw data. Quite a lot of that was the nanopore data. So if anybody's familiar with nanopore, uh, Sarah's nodding. <laughs> uh, if anybody's familiar with nanopore, um, you get these files called fast fives, which are different from uh, fast Qs or fast As, which you may be familiar with if you've done any bioinformatics before. Um, and they encode quite a lot of information from the sequencing itself. So nanopore sequencing has a nanopore, that's uh, how it gets its name. And as DNA strands go through, it creates um, like a, a squiggle. So this squiggle plot is often the thing that um, gives, is a lot of uh, information and other telemetry from that. So when we got this eight terabytes back, um, we had to think sort of storage, and backup originally, always remember, back up your data. Um, <laughs> and also, how would we do the an analysis? And I think Sarah and I would both agree that the fact having some uh, bioinformatics training in our back pocket meant that we didn't just utterly panic when handed that hard drive um, or handed the link to the files to download. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, please. So James already touched on quite a lot of this. Um, so our main bottleneck for what we do is it actually takes up a lot of computational power. So with this eight terabyte um, data set, just the initial step, which is often assembly and polishing for metagenomics, used about over 500 gigabytes of RAM in certain different steps and generated around 700 gigabytes of intermediary files. So if we hadn't, A, if we didn't have the high performance computing that James already mentioned available at York, so that's Viking for us, luckily, um, and B, if we hadn't thought about, and if we didn't know how many intermediary files or that we'd be expecting an extra terabyte on top of this eight terabytes we already had to store, this would have been quite terrifying. Um, so if you go to the next slide, please. So I just, this was an extreme example and also very quick. Um, <laughs> um, but I think the takeaway from this is that data sets are becoming larger. Um, and we really, really need people with the skills to be able to deal with them. Um, also, please don't forget about storage. I'm just going to say that multiple times. <laughs> so 
for this training is training early on is key just so that you can a plan your experiments effectively um if you don't have the capacity to deal with eight terabytes of data don't try and generate an experiment that will generate eight terabytes of um data also it prevents you from panicking uh, when you receive large amounts of data so like i said this is an extreme example quite often for metagenomes you'll get sort of 200 gigabytes but even that most uh, desktop computers won't be able to either store or handle the computational um, power needed to process that. And also training um, means that you can identify where you might get any computational bottlenecks. Um, and I guess this is where all of the projects we're hearing about today comes in. So um, they all sound, the ones that I'm not familiar with, uh, all sound great and um, sound like they'll be very useful to be engaged with and to help solve quite a lot of these problems before hopefully you hit those um hit them i think that's my last slide yes thank you evelyn are you happy for me to show your slides or do you want to click through them yourself uh no we can do it it's all right excellent cool so i'm good i guess taking a slightly different angle for this very last bit quite a few people have already mentioned uh fair the idea of something being fair or fair data so FAIR is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So I was going to give you a very quick overview of what that entails. And although I've referred to data on the slides, I'm going to talk to you about how we've made our cloud span resources, how we're trying to make our cloud span resources as fair as possible, um, to show you, kind of show that all this, that training is great, but training is even better when you can make it open source and make it as reusable and as accessible as possible to people. So we'll start with findable, which is the next slide. So findable is about making sure that people actually know, like people can actually get your data if they don't know it already exists. So the two main two ways you do this are using metadata. So that's the data about your data or your resource um, or your asset that you're, that you're putting on the internet. Um, so it gives an overview of the data set or the resource and it allows it to be tagged and tracked and indexed in the registry so people can then filter and search it. Um, and then one aspect of this metadata that's particularly important is a persistent identifier. Uh, so you will have come across DOIs, digital object identifiers. You probably have an ORCID ID. And those are both long lasting links that will, when you type them in, it will always take you to the same page, basically. It prevents this idea of link rot where links expire and you just get like a blank page when you try and click on something. Uh, and they, they should be unique to the data, the data, data set or the asset that you're tagging them with. Um, so that, that persistent identifier is a really important part of making sure that something is findable, not just now, but also into the future. Um, the next one is accessibility. So this is about um, making sure that once people have found your data, they, they know how they can get access to it. It doesn't necessarily mean that your data is open. Um, your data can be fair and, and as a result accessible without it being um, open source. Um, but you need to, you should be making it clear uh, how people can retrieve the data if they get authorization to. So you can have very like sensitive data sets that are still fair, um, as long as it's clear inside the metadata how people can access it. Um, and also a part of accessibility is meta, the metadata being persistent. Again, this idea of persistence. So even after the data set's no longer available, um, it's, ideally the metadata should still be available so that uh, for example, you can track down the people originally associated who originally did that research um, and also just get information that even if you don't have the actual data itself, you still have some information about what date, what kind of data was generated, which may still be useful into the future. Um, so then I is for interoperable. Um, so interoperability has kind of two aspects. The main um, where it's talked about in the original FAIR principles that were laid out a few years ago is about how computers can talk to, basically talk to your data and categorize your data. So this idea of, of com a common vocabulary um, or a controlled vocabulary, it's sometimes called, um, which basically allow, like, it means that everybody's using the same words to talk about the same things. So rather than using nine or 10 different keyword words to describe one specific idea. Um, a, co a controlled vocabulary, it's also sometimes called an ontology, 
um, is is the way of making sure that everyone uses this, just one particular way of describing something. And those are often field field specific. So um, you will would be you'll be you should be able to look up online what ontology or often repositories will use their own specific ontology, for example. Um, so you can browse that and find what the right words are to describe what your data is about. But then the other aspect of it that people often think about as well is making something interoperable between different computers and uh, different users. So that involves using standardized and open source formats. So for example, this Google Slides PowerPoint is a .pptx uh, file, which means you can open it in not just in Microsoft PowerPoint, which you would, would be the case if it was a .ppt format, uh, you can open it also in Google Slides and also in any other open source pre like presentation uh, softwares. So it doesn't use a it doesn't use proprietary file formats. And again, obviously those will so something like PowerPoint is something lots of people use, but there'll also be field spe field specific uh, data formats, and those that they, they, there will be standards within the field. There should be standards within the field about what is the appropriate. Uh, like format to use. And then finally, uh, reusable. So the, all of these things really are about making your data as reusable as possible. Um, so this, sec this part is really like a summary of the other things. So making your data reusable means having really rich metadata. So including as much information as possible in that metadata that gives people the context of how that data was generated. So that might be, for example, in a, protein database repository that might include including involve including links to the um, journal article where that data was that, that data was first published as a part of um, but also just including information about how it was generated um, who did it what what equipment was used all of that stuff just basically as much information as you can cram in as possible and then also reusability and um, the other aspect of reusability is about licensing so that's telling people how they can reuse that data. So the licenses we use for our resources, our training resources are um, CCBY licenses, which is basically uh, any, you can re, you can, anyone can reuse it and remix it and do whatever they want with it as long as they give credit. That's the most open kind of um, creative commons license you can get, but you can also get more restrictive licenses. Um, and so all of the, basically the point of all of this is to make sure that when you've, you've spent a lot of time and money generating data, uh, other people can then go on to use it in the future and you can get as much value out of that data as possible. And, this, and I, I've, I've talked about data throughout this, but the same goes for resources. So things like our training resources, we have uh, tagged them with metadata so that they can be indexed in uh, Elixir's test te uh, repository for teaching resources. Um, we've put them on a website called Zenodo, which gives you a DOI. So we have a persistent identifier for them. Um, they're all freely accessible to anybody and you access them using an HTML web page, which is anybody with an internet browser can access that. Um, we use, we try and use sort of like field specific um, file standards and formats. Uh, and we also, um, and I guess as, as I've also mentioned, we have uh, this, uh, Creative Commons license that means anybody can reuse it uh, and give us credit and sort of improve on it in the future after, after this project ends. So that's just a very quick overview of what FAIR means because it's come up a couple of times. Um, if you've got questions though, feel free to ask in the panel. Uh, this, just signal this slide. Okay, hey, thanks very much, Evelyn. Um, so everyone has given their talks about their learning resources. So if people want to uh, put us some questions in the chat, we can have a discussion about uh, kind of anything to do with training, basically. Um, so I think what Evelyn was talking about with um, FAIR has obviously come up quite a bit in all of the different uh, presentations that was all given. And it's a really good theme to make sure that if you are doing stuff, you are doing things in a reproducible way. Um, and that's what we really want to push with um, 
any training that people are developing or any courses that are going on. Because another thing as well is that you don't want to put together a course and then nobody else to be able to use it. And then you have to recreate the course again. So it's trying to be time saving for us, but to also to everybody else. Um, has anybody got anything they would like to ask? So has anybody got any questions about what kinds of bioinformatics they might want to do that's kind of within the EBNet remit or outside of the EBNet remit? Sir, there are some questions coming up in the chat, do you see? There, I think it's mostly asking about whether people want to put links. I think we can probably have a, we can probably, we can probably send um, an email to everybody that's come to this talk um, with all of the links that we would like to include from our slides. And the slides will also be available afterwards as will this presentation. And um, so these get uploaded to EBNet's YouTube channel. If, if, I if there's could, anything if, on here that people want to. Sorry, come on. No, sorry. Yes, if I could avail, avail of a couple of seconds to follow up with, with what I was saying before. So yes, indeed. It's an interest of everybody not to uh, reinvent the wheel constantly, although it's clear that uh, local groups will develop their uh, own take, own version of the same resources, also because it's part of the, of the exercise. New people will be coming in and et cetera. It's good uh, to a certain extent to uh, be connected, to know what's, uh, uh, what's in the market around a certain topic. It's also good when, you know, as uh, at, at Dash, we are interested in peer reviewing our, um, the courses that we are developing, because when you develop uh, some training material, you know, there are also pathways to uh, official publications and also getting credit, putting something in your curriculum, et cetera. There are various ways of doing this, et cetera. So it's good to, um, to peer review, to uh, talk to each other, for example, uh, if anyone here uh, is interested in reproducing using our courses is very good. And I'm sure that we would be interested in um, in running the courses that you are uh, that you are developing. Another couple of things, and I will be finished. Please, if you're interested, look at the list of uh, Ed Dash workshops because there are a lot of places and a lot of things that you might be interested in and circulate them. And also, if you want to teach paid, which is a great opportunity for, for example, PhD students, get in touch. We've got one question about uh, doing the Carpentries instructor course. So I can say, I know that definitely four of us on this call have definitely done the instructor course. And Bakrain probably knows when the next one is coming up. Sorry, did oh, I cut? No, sorry, sorry to interrupt here. And actually this is extremely um, timely because SSI, the Software Sustainability Institute, uh, uh, Alexandra Nenadic, I, our training leader, uh, leads on this. And I had a chat this morning. We have 50 places to uh, fill by October. So please, if there are people, and Alexandra insisted that uh, we would, we'll do a push as soon as possible. Probably you will see announcements, but whoever in this meeting now, in this uh, seminar, who is interested in this, please get in touch with me. I'm writing the email again. Uh, Zeni, you had a question. Well, more, more than a question, I was going to answer <laughs> something on the chat. I think Emma was answering it as well. Um, we haven't mentioned it, and um, there's tests available, and that is um, a European resource, but really is open to everyone. And I, I put it in the chat again, just in case. It's going through right now a little bit of a revamp but it's, it's a really good place to find all sorts of training. And also if you're looking to get a course for you to deliver training, you can also find it there. And if you want your training materials to appear there, you can also submit them. So it covers quite a lot if you want to use it. I don't know if Emma, you want to say something else. I know that you put it as well about tests. 
no, I was only trying to find the link. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> well, that's where we're going to put our resources. Uh, somebody's had a question about the size of data. So I guess following on from Annie's talk about do we do do we have efficient ways to compress data size? Um, and I guess for me and Annabelle in our work, I'd say that what we usually do is we have raw data that so we have fast keys for our sequencing data and they are compressed um, into like a GZIP format, which makes them a bit smaller. But in terms of when we have active projects, what we generally do is we monthly go and um, compress our project files into TARS, which are a very compressed format, and then we back them up. So one way that we, we try and minimize having everything um, at its full size is we regularly create TARS from um, our raw data and our analysis. That's one, so that we make sure we back everything up and two, so that it doesn't consume all of our quota on Viking. Yeah, and just to follow up on that, I think from specifically about Nanopore, I know that there's been work developing, I think it's called slow five rather than fast five, um, sort of trying to get the files to be a bit smaller and a bit more manageable. I think they're doing some other um, performance things. So that's always something especially with, I'm, I'm going to use the word cutting edge. I don't know if we can class nanopore as that anymore. Um, probably still. Um, with that type of thing is when you can generate a lot, I think it, it just become the, the bottleneck. Um, there is yeah. also, if you are backing up your data, um, so York has something called the vault, which is a form of glacier storage. Um, which you might have at your university if you're not at York, which is the idea is that you can have really big stores of data. So we have about 20 terabytes backed up. But the idea is, is that data, this is data that you are archiving and you're not accessing very readily. So it's quite cheap to keep it there as a backup. But I guess the downside is that if you were going to access it readily, you wouldn't be able to because it's very, very slow to download. Um, so if storage is a problem at your university, they probably have something very similar. Um, and I think AWS also has some equivalents as well. Yeah, as Annie said, cold storage. And uh, Pronomics is definitely useful, I think, for people that would wanna do, they, there's no prior knowledge about uh, bioinformatics at all. Um, if you have an idea of sequencing, that's useful, but I don't think it's a prerequisite for pronomics at all to know about sequencing, I don't think. Uh, Emma might be able to. So we, we go over all the file formats that we cover in the course and the genomics course as well. Um, has anybody got any other questions that they'd like to put in the chat? If not, I think that means that we've actually come 10 minutes early off the end of our session. So that's actually really good and timely. Um, I'd like to thank everybody that spoke today um, and uh, everybody that's come to the talks and I think everybody's probably found them quite useful and we can definitely um, send around um, our contact information if people want to give their contact